when I moved to Chicago in 1995, I think there might have been one organization at the time that was one or two organizations that were focused on prisons specifically. One was the John Howard Association. I think the other one was the Juvenile Justice Initiative as a lobbying group. The idea of kind of the idea of doing work with prisoners on behalf of prisoners had fallen out of vogue, so to speak. Um, after a period of intense organizing mostly from the inside in the 1970s. The 1980s, I just think were just, like nobody knew what was going on and that's when the buildup was at its highest. But people were being, you know, thinking about crack cocaine and like all over the place, HIV AIDS, like there were all these other things that were taking up energies of people who were organizing, though people were still doing stuff around prison. By the time it was, I would say, 10 years later, um, there were a few more organizations and people who were interested, but it was still, there was still not this kind of um, bipartisan, supposed consensus around the fact that we were in a period where um, it was, there was a hyper-incarceration happening of particular populations and that it, the, the term mass incarceration was not being bandied about. Um, I think people were trying to figure out where they were standing and what they were doing. And if you had friends on the inside, you were writing to them and you know, trying to figure out what to do along those lines. Um, and I just, now there's this massive explosion of interest, of discussion, of research, of books. Like within the 10 years between 2005 to 2015, it is unrecognizable to me um, just how many people say they care about imprisonment and surveillance and policing. And I think that has really a lot of positive aspects to it where I see openings for new partnerships and abilities for people to um, maybe actually bring our energies together and our resources together to win some things. Um, so I see that as very much of a positive intervention and that involves new openings and places that we might be able to make a difference. I'm also really, really concerned um, at the ways that people are cutting the issue where some people are very much deserving of being free and other people are absolutely not deserving of being free. They deserve to be where they are. There's no questioning of the brutality and horror of the prison for those people. If you are nonviolent, if you're you know, using drugs, if you're mentally ill, if you're like the, the, the kind of the fissures of you know, who gets to be free concern me a great deal. The conversations that are not being had about violence and the use of violence, and the fact that most people are in prisons, state prisons, for use of some form of violence. Um, there's just no, it doesn't feel like there's actually space to engage that because the story has been so tilted to the drug war and to other things that are like the, ex the explanation for how we got to where we got, when in fact that's not the main explanation at all. There are many reasons we got to where we got. Therefore, there are going to be many ways that we have to fight to get out of where we're at. Um, and that just feels actually foreclosed in this moment in a weird way. That if you bring that up, somehow that's like the downer thing to be doing. Um, and you're not actually riding the wave of all of this greatness and goodness that um, people are out there selling. Um, and when I, what I think is that we're actually reinforcing the system we're actually reinforcing the, the terribleness of the system through the way that we choose to fight. I worry a lot about that. Um, I worry that we're not all on the same page around the use of what language, we're how we're talking about things, and also what theories we're using, um, what analysis we're using. I don't think we're all on the same page, and so that's hard also. 
um, to figure out how that's going to you know, work itself out. I think just the other day I was reading in the paper that um, Cook County Jail, which is the largest single site jail in the country, um, which is in Chicago, um, that there's been a marked decrease in the numbers of people in jail. And on the surface, that looks and sounds great because that jail is a hell hole. And I had been in that jail so often, I'd had to go there with, when young folks were in, on the inside, I'd had to interact with the jail for 20 years. But it turns out that what happened is that a whole bunch of people have been put on electronic monitoring, which people think is better than a cage. And I want to be really careful here because I myself am not imprisoned. I'm not locked up. And sometimes I always remind myself that that's true. And I still want to also be vigilant about extending the cage beyond the walls. I want to be vigilant about how we define confinement and captivity and imprisonment. And I don't think that electronic monitoring is an appropriate alternative to prison. It may be something else, but it isn't, for me, a viable alternative to imprisonment. Because I think it's going to be harder in some ways for people to exist in that world. Not than, not than being caged, but how then are you going to work? And you're expected to this time. How then are you going to go to school? How then are you going to deal with the things that you're now expected to do that behind bars you're actually not expected to do? Um, how, is, how are those things going to work out? How are we, are we going to have a whole entire set of millions of people electronically in prison now? How are we going to fight that? I'm really concerned about that. You know, I'm, I'm really concerned about um, the push for how people are thinking about policing and the police, um, you know, the rush to want to throw out these, you know, quote-unquote reforms that are actually really deleterious and are going to make it even harder to actually dismantle policing um, in, the, not in the short term, not even in the long term. This push for more technologies and uh, more ways for people to be surveilled when you should be pushing against that very strongly. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I have places where I, days where I feel very optimistic that there are real things, that openings in places where we can make a, a, a real difference. And then there are days when I'm much more, um, pe not able, I don't want to use the word pessimistic, where I'm much more cynical, I think is the right word for me, about what's being offered and why and who and who are the people that we're supposed to be in, quote, community with to fight, and what are their real intentions and motives. That matters. What are they trying to do? Um, so yes, yeah, so I've been thinking a lot about those things. I'm thinking a lot about money and the fact that, you know, I am very much, I've been pushing decarceration as one tool to get us towards abolition. And I'm worried that, you know, People are were successful, were getting successful in many states at closing facilities. And those facilities are now being offered as immigrant detention jails. Uh, the youth facilities that are closed are being repurposed for adults. The, none of the money that is supposedly saved by the closure of these facilities is devolving to the community. The community is still being divested from. And then the question is, like, why aren't you all successful at being able to, you know, it's like, what are you talking about here, really? So I'm really concerned on the multiple levels. Um, does not does it mean that I'm not hopeful? No, of course it doesn't. I have hope all the time. I have to in order to be able to, uh, you know, fight another day.